Hi, I'm Scott Sipker. And I'm Amanda Mullen, and we'll be your guides to the natural and sometimes not so natural wonders found right here in the state of Iowa. So welcome to the premier edition of Iowa Outdoors. On this edition of Iowa Outdoors, we'll take you to a frozen farm where a band of flatland mountaineers have found a unique solution to our sometimes vertically challenged state. We'll visit a 450-acre short grass prairie in central Iowa where game birds are planted to be harvested by hunters. And we'll venture out onto the frozen tundra of Spirit Lake for some wintertime fishing. Chef John Benedict will share a recipe for a stick to your ribs, warm you up on a cold winter's day, pheasant casserole. And we'll travel to DeSoto Bend to catch the fall migration and visit with wildlife photographer Don Pogensee, who shares some tips that could help you take better nature pictures. We think we have something for everyone, so sit tight. Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors was provided through a Reap Conservation Education Program grant. Up to $350,000 are available annually to support educational projects about Iowa's natural resources. Information is available at www.iowadnr.gov. The Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interest of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, medical care and social services, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. We're here at Ledges State Park, just south of Boone in central Iowa. Established in 1924, the park is one of the oldest and most popular of Iowa's nearly 90 state parks. The sandstone ledges for which the park was named were cut by glacial meltwaters 13,000 years ago. Visitors at the park can camp, hike, fish, and bicycle, but climbing the sandstone outcrops is strictly forbidden. So, what is a rock climber stuck in the gently rolling hills of Iowa to do? Well, you could visit a small farm just outside of Cedar Falls where prairie-bound mountaineers have found a way to test the confines of gravity by taking advantage of freezing temperatures. 80 feet of vertical ice, a frozen waterfall that covers the north side of a silo just west of Cedar Falls and a challenge to even the most experienced of climbers. Oh my gosh, I was packed with outdoor opportunities. I mean, the state is really filled with people like me doing tons of different things like this. This is world-class climbing in Iowa. Charlie Whitmack knows a lot about climbing. He has stood atop mountain peaks all over the world, and in 1993 became the first Iowan to climb the world's highest mountain when he reached the summit of Mount Everest. We're just out here training and, and just having a fun time. You know, it's great to come out here and bring new people into the sport in a setting that's very safe right. and accessible. <laughs> safe most of the time. <laughs> and uh, it's just fun, you know. It's just if you love the outdoors, you love doing stuff, and that's what we're doing out here. Dribbling water down from the top of a silo, hoping that it would freeze so you could later climb it, was the brainchild of Don Briggs. Don is a physical education instructor at the University of Northern Iowa. One day, while helping a friend with some field work, he began eyeing the surrounding silos and imagining ways to climb them. And then all of a sudden the light bulb went on. Maybe we could spray it down with water, and if the ice would adhere to the silo, maybe that would work. So I asked the farmer, and he said, sure, go ahead. I don't use the, the silos anyway, and, and just help yourself. Go ahead. Don received some expert advice and learned all one needs to make ice is water and freezing temperatures. Both are readily available during an Iowa winter. Don also learned that to get the world's attention, all you have to do is create a uniquely Iowa challenge. We had uh, actually a world champion ice climber from uh, uh, Canada, and uh, he climbed the ice and he said, this is one of the most difficult places to climb. I've climbed a lot of different places, and silo ice climbing is more difficult than anything I've ever climbed because it's pure vertical. The silo is open to anyone who cares to test Iowa's gravitational pull. If you care to climb, all you need is warm clothing. 
The ropes, helmets, safety glasses, ice axes, harnesses, boots, and crampons are all provided. $35 buys you an all-day pass and a lesson on climbing with an emphasis on safety. And if you should lose your grip, it also buys you the peace of mind that the person on the other end of the rope is trained to keep you from an icy demise. You know, we're, we, the biggest thing out here is our n rule number one is no one gets hurt. Uh, safety, safety, safety is what we practice at all times. We check everything three times. We don't need any injuries or, you know, we're out here to have fun, not get somebody hurt. People that have tested the ice encrusted silo range from experts to novices. Climbers have to be at least 10 years old, but there is no upper age limit. So far, the oldest person to challenge the ice was 86. Yeah, it takes a lot more arm strength than um, regular climbing, and it's a lot harder. Jacob made it all the way to the top of the silo, but does belong to a climbing club and has the advantage of young muscles. It's not an easy climb, and not everyone is capable of summiting the silo, where success is shared with the ring of a bell. It really helps to be in, in, in good uh, shape for this. Uh, a lot of people think you have to be really strong upper body wise, but actually it's your legs that get you up the silo. Um, we've had, I'm gonna say maybe one in 25 people make it to the top the first time. And um, uh, most people get up about 10, 20 feet and they start to fatigue. Their arms get really tired because they've been using their arms to climb as opposed to their legs. And they'll come back down and go in the warming house, get a cup of hot chocolate and relax a little bit and then go back out and they always go higher the second time. So it's a, a real quick learning curve with the, uh, with the silo ice climbing. and um, It's fun to watch the people progress as they, as they get better. The silo is on Rusty Lime Master's farm, about three and a half miles west of Cedar Falls and just off Highway 57. It was four years ago Don Briggs approached Rusty with what seemed to be a questionable request to ice down one of his grain bins. I thought he was absolutely crazy. And my youngest daughter happened to be home at the time. She said, Dad, let's do that. And Briggs hopped all over it. And, and like they say, the rest is history. It took off from there, yeah. It gives me something to do in January and February when things are pretty slow around here. It's, it's, it's been very enjoyable. At 80 feet, the silo was roughly the height of an eight-story building. The reward for climbers who reach the top is not only a feeling of accomplishment, but also a view that, according to Don, is really pretty cool. Climbs begin when temperatures are consistently below 26 degrees. You can check for climbing conditions or find directions to the silo by visiting siloiceclimbing.com. My, my dream someday is to be driving down the highway and look off in the distance and see a silo, another silo, with ice on it and that somebody else has taken this on and, and, and run with it. Don has shown that there are plenty of Iowa fields where dreams can become realities, and that if you build it, they will come. Oh, I think it's wonderful that Iowa has something like this. I think we have all these little hidden nuggets in Iowa, and this is another one of those things. Um, it's just beautiful. You know, you get out into the country, and then all of a sudden, you've got an opportunity like this right here in front of you. At Ledges State Park, there's a memorial to Murray Lee Hutton. Hutton was a civil engineer with a strong commitment to conservation. In 1935, he was named the first director of the Iowa State Conservation Commission, which we all know now as the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. The DNR is responsible for managing not only state parks like ledges here, but all land, water, and wildlife resources. But for the preeminent game bird in Iowa, the ringneck pheasant, a one-two punch of dwindling habitat and terrible weather have left this bird looking for a comeback. Iowa's pheasants are nearing record population lows as hunters bring home fewer and fewer birds. But what's to blame? Is it too much moisture? Is it agriculture? DNR wildlife biologist Todd Bogenschutz says it's not that simple. 
The biggest impact on us recently here in the last couple years has just been the, the series of winters we've had. We've had bad winters and a lot of flooding, 08 and this year. And I know folks think it, you know, well, certainly I always had bad weather before, and that is true, but uh, the difference this time around is just the, the timing of it, the consecutive nature of it. It's, we've had four consecutive winters now with 30 to 40 inches of snow. We've had 30, 40 inch snow winters before, but not four consecutively. Regardless of habitat or weather, pheasant hunters and some conservationists are searching for new ideas. A bill aimed at boosting pheasant populations sailed through the Iowa State House in 2010. That measure legalized the practice of releasing farm-raised pheasants on private land. The exercise isn't new to Iowa, but only licensed game preserves could previously buy pen-reared birds for release. We certainly would like to see the wild bird population recover because with that comes a crop of uh, hunters. At Doc's Hunt Club near Adel, Iowa, hunters come for a scheduled expedition. No worries about a three-hour walk without birds here. Customers purchase the number of pheasants to be preset for their hunt and give their dogs an outdoor workout. We buy pheasants and chucker and quail from various suppliers who, who uh, raise the birds. Uh, we work actively to find the suppliers that have the most, the most healthy, best flying birds. Uh, healthy is, is key. And, uh, and we buy birds in smaller quantities to make sure the birds are still in good shape. We've had a number of calls, uh, people calling us and asking about it and, and asking how to release and, and how to go about that. So I think we'll see a number of birds released next year uh, by individuals. Bud Wood leads Murray McMurray Hatchery in Webster City where millions of chicks are hatched and shipped across the country every year. Murray McMurray is one of three hatcheries that can legally sell pen-raised pheasants for release by Iowa landowners. For 120 birds, you could get started for under $300. You know, you're gonna have some other costs, feed and uh, some equipment, but in that range. Murray McMurray's pheasants make a hundreds mile long journey from Southern Wisconsin and the nation's largest pheasant farm. McFarland pheasants of Janesville, Wisconsin, produced over 1.5 million chicks and 400,000 mature birds in 2010 alone, many of which can be found here at McFarland's acres of outdoor netted pens filled with ringneck pheasants. We produce eggs, we collect the eggs, we hatch the eggs, just like other types of agriculture, we raise the young birds up till they're able to go out in these pens, and then they're brought out in these pens, and they're raised till they're mature, and then we catch them up and ship them off to our customers. These birds will travel real well. They're protected in these crates, have virtually no mortality on the way to Wyoming. We'll be there tomorrow morning. They'll be unloaded tomorrow morning. Bill McFarlane argues that pen-raised pheasants have a role to play in repopulating states like Iowa. But the DNR's top upland game specialist is skeptical. The DNR's also looked at using pen-raised birds with turkeys and, and whatnot and pheasants. And this survival of pen-raised birds is just abysmal. I mean, it's basically a complete failure every time we've evaluated it. There's no doubt with the loss of habitat, if the wild pheasants went away and you release pen-raised birds into a pl place where the wild pheasants weren't able to live, the pen-raised pheasants aren't going to be able to live either. That just makes sense. Pen-raised birds have been brought up here on a pheasant farm raised in pen conditions. I'm not going to say that our birds are as wild or ever could be as wild as a wild pheasant. But again, those wild pheasants that are out in Iowa at one point came from game farm pheasants. According to the Iowa DNR, ringnecks were accidentally released for the first time in the early 1900s during a severe windstorm that wrecked the pens of a game breeder near Cedar Falls. The DNR later began stocking pheasants around 1910. A familiar tagline for the conservation group Pheasants Forever is Habitat, Habitat, Habitat. The latest PF initiative is just that, hiring young biologists to cultivate new CRP opportunities and reload Iowa. But it won't be easy. Hunters and conservationists can only hope for a mild winter 
and a drier spring. The diehards amongst us may even try a new venture, hoping to buy back the glory days of Iowa's ringneck pheasant. In each episode of Iowa Outdoors, Chef John Benedict will share a recipe that we're sure you'll want to cook. This week, he'll prepare a pheasant casserole that we feel is a perfect cold weather dish. We're back from our hunt and I got some beautiful pheasants. I'm gonna take you into the kitchen. I'm gonna show you how to make Doc's famous pheasant casserole. I'm sure you're gonna love it. And I'm gonna show you a little trick here that I learned in order to check to see if there's any lead shot left in the pheasant breast. I've got them all nicely boned out here and I'm just gonna hold them up to the light and look through them to see if there's any lead shot left in. And this breast looks pretty clean. So I'm gonna go ahead and take these pheasant breasts and I'm gonna cut them into a few pieces so we can make our pheasant casserole. Add all that to the rest of it. We're gonna spice it up a little bit with some salt, pepper, onion powder, garlic powder. We're just gonna add some of these seasonings. We're gonna add a couple tablespoons of flour. And we're gonna go ahead and mix all this up. And we're gonna walk over to our stove here and we're gonna to start to brown all this meat off in our Dutch oven. I'm gonna add a couple tablespoons of oil to my Dutch oven and I'm gonna to start to brown off my pheasant. I'm just gonna go ahead and lay it out in a single layer in here. Spread it out. And try to brown it on all sides. This will take a couple minutes or so. Get all of it in here. Looks like our pheasant breast meat is getting nice and brown here in our Dutch oven. I'm gonna go ahead and add the rest of the ingredients for our casserole here. I have some chopped up carrots, onions, and celery. I'm gonna go ahead and just add that to the Dutch oven. I have one cup of brown rice. It's right on top. I have one can of cream of mushroom soup. one cup of water, and a half a cup of milk. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stir all this together so everything's mixed in real well and it gets all the flavors off the bottom of the Dutch oven. Make sure everything's nicely incorporated. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cover it up with the lid and I'm gonna put it into a 350 degree oven here for about the first half an hour or so. After the first half an hour of cooking, I'm gonna turn the oven down to 300 degrees and let it cook for that last hour at 300 degrees. Well, our pheasant casserole's now been cooking for about an hour and a half total. And we're gonna go ahead and pull it out of the oven and check it out. This is a really easy casserole to make. Oh, it just smells excellent as well. You know, you can substitute any upland game bird or chicken if you like with this casserole. You know, one of the things we really love to serve with our Doc's Famous Pheasant Casserole, these garlic biscuits. And with this nice hot piping casserole and these garlic biscuits, there's nothing better to eat after a good day of hunting. I'm Chef John Benedict, and thanks for coming into my kitchen to make Doc's Famous Pheasant Casserole. For many Iowans, the thought of visiting Okoboji and Spirit Lake conjures up summer memories. But those lakes and surrounding communities don't disappear after Labor Day. As winter approaches, We'll visit the frozen tundra of Spirit Lake where ice fishing is as hot as ever. It's winter in the northwestern corner of Iowa. The summer tourist destination of Okoboji is quiet. Arnold's Park is shuttered, its roller coaster covered in snow. The tourist vessel Queen 2 is cocooned in ice as the region's lakes are amongst the first in Iowa to freeze. Just miles north on Big Spirit Lake, the sleepy border community is beginning to stir. Calm, quiet, cold. Those are the first thoughts that come to mind when you first set foot on Spirit Lake in the dead of winter. But there is a reason the ice anglers of Northwest Iowa flock here every year. Some of the best winter fishing in the entire state. Once the ice on Spirit Lake reaches a safe depth, 
anglers gradually venture out on foot, then snowmobile, then full-size trucks before the onslaught of full-blown winter ice fishing begins. This is golden hour for the fish bite. We try to get set up around 6.30 and from 6.30 to usually 8 o'clock is our best bite. Fish are very, very aggressive at dawn and dusk on Spirit Lake. The perch and walleye especially love low light conditions. It's just, it's a better feeding opportunity for the fish. Oop, there we go, we got fish on me. There's, there's some fish, we got fish, guys. There we go. Spirit Lake perch. Ryan and thousands of anglers have cut their teeth on decades of fish populations that have fluctuated from bad times to good. Almost continuously since 1957, we've been uh, tracking angler harvest and, and the number of fish that are coming off of the lake. And uh, this year, we've, uh, we harvested a little over, we estimated a little over 200,000 perch that were harvested off of Big Spirit Lake, which, which is the largest uh, harvest year that we've had. The flood of fish brings the anglers, who then provide a welcome boost to the area's relatively dormant off-season economy. This year we, we saw uh, about, we estimated about 50, a little over 50,000 anglers that took, um, took advantage of angling on Big Spirit Lake. That's just Big Spirit Lake. That doesn't include the other, the other big lakes here. This isn't the first time this community has tried to carve a wintertime economic boost. Just ask the region's ice-bound businessmen of the early 1900s. Iowa's Great Lakes, like Spirit and Okoboji, were once home to a budding industry, ice harvesting. In the days before common household refrigeration, contractors feverishly sliced the region's ice into giant 700-pound slabs destined for homes and businesses near and far. And while the winter machinery of 1910 has long disappeared, the fish are now flourishing. Ice fishing uh, seems to be a little bit daunting for folks, but um, it couldn't be a neater time to take a child out, you know, and, and it's, a, uh, again, a neat atmosphere out on the lake. Um, and it's, when fishing's like it is now, it's a great time to take a, a new angler out and get him introduced to fishing. The 21st century ice carving is more about what's underneath, the joy of angling, and the solemn solitude of Spirit Lake at sunset. Beautiful golden hour images, like those you just saw in Spirit Lake, can be a photographer's dream. So to help guide those budding shutterbugs out there, and some of the experts too, we'll profile a new nature photographer on every episode of Iowa Outdoors. Don Pogensee's photographs have appeared in over 70 newspapers and magazines all over the world. With over 200,000 shots in his photographic library, he's obviously experienced some of the state's natural wonders. We spent some time with Don at the DeSoto National Wildlife Refuge, which every year becomes a temporary home for over half a million migratory birds. People say, yeah, they, they get nice National Geographic magazine or one of the other nature magazines. Oh, those images are so beautiful. You know, how did they do that? Well, it's time and it's effort. And uh, you might call it a setup shot, but it's still uh, waiting for that species to be there at that particular time, the lighting, you go back often, you know, hour after hour, and yeah, you come up with those scenes, they just don't happen, it takes time and patience, and you're the key, you're the photographer. It takes time, it takes maybe weeks, it takes, uh, you know, sometimes going back over and over and over again to get that, uh, to get that image, it doesn't happen uh, the first time out, or the 20th time out, it may happen the 21st time. Uh, we're using a Canon uh, telephoto lens, it's a 600 millimeter f4 lens, a uh, Canon uh, high-end uh, digital body, this is a 7D. This is a Wimberley mount, uh, and I can go back and forth, I can pan with the subjects in flight, 
uh, and uh, I got full stability on a good, strong tripod. What I try to do, I try to lock the sensor on whatever the main subject is, if it's a lead eagle or, you know, if it's a group or something, and keep that sensor on the bird, and then it's just a matter of uh, moving with it. And uh, you'll find uh, uh, that most of those shots are going to be great shots. They're going to be sharp. They're going to be, uh, you know, provided you got the camera set, you can shoot fast enough shutter speed to stop the motion and that sort of thing. If the lighting is good, the subject is good, uh, and I'm working on behavior, you know, you can shoot hundreds of images. Uh, but then again, uh, every image that you shoot, you know, I think, uh, is it the same as the one I just shot? Or is it a little bit different? Or how many hours am I going to sit on my computer at home and work on 3,000 images of the same thing? You know, Iowa has a lot of wildlife. You know, we have a lot of white-tailed deer. We have a lot of turkeys. We have, we're, you know, right in the middle of a migration route with the uh, Missouri River. Uh, migration pattern, the Mississippi River uh, patterns. Uh, and so we, we do have a lot of wildlife, but unfortunately, most people don't get to see it because they're so busy, they're consumed with their work and their job and coming here and going there. Photographers like Don Pogency have rediscovered DeSoto after a down migratory cycle for the famous oxbow of the Missouri River and a renewed focus on wetland management. We're working on this year is is uh, a wetland restoration plan to increase the numbers of wetland acres on the refuge. Migratory habitat means food uh, covered in water. Uh, in order to produce the food, such as what we're standing in here, it's a lot of annual plants, which requires disturbance. So in many cases, we'll dry this wetland up in the summertime and disk it. Uh, and that sets back the succession, much like fire will rejuvenate a prairie. And, and sometimes it's just plain luck. The migration comes, the right wind patterns, and where the birds are nesting in the Great Plains, and everything comes together just right for you. So hopefully it'll just continue to grow. These birds sometimes seem to find these areas and remember them from year to year, and hopefully we can continue to have this number grow. That wraps up this edition of Iowa Outdoors. We're going to leave you with a bit more of the fall migration from DeSoto Bend National Wildlife Refuge. But before we do, we'd like to leave you with this thought. There are plenty of outdoors activities to do in the state of Iowa, regardless of weather or season. But it's up to you to make it happen. Hey, Scott, did you know there were 13 miles of hiking trails in Ledger State Park and at least one fully accessible interpretive trail? I do now. To subscribe to Iowa Outdoors magazine, please visit the Iowa DNR website or call 1-800-361-8072. Funding for Iowa Outdoors was provided through a Reef Conservation Education Program grant. Up to $350,000 are available annually to support educational projects about Iowa's natural resources. Information is available at www.iowadnr.gov. The Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interest of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, medical care and social services, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief.